choose a topic. Yeah. African American legends highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining me on today's program is Reverend James Forbes, Senior Minister of Riverside Church. And Jim, as we say on this program, both individuals and institutions are legends. And in this inst instance, you are an individual who is a legend, and Riverside Church, of course, is a legend. And the black church itself is legendary in our history. Uh, so I thought we'd begin by just having some conversation about the role of the black church, uh, the historic role of the black church in African-American struggle for freedom and justice in this country. Mm -hmm. The African-American struggle would not even be possible if it had not been for the black church. Just as a mother who nourishes a child is expected to usher that child to the child's fullest potential, so the black church has been the mother in the African-American community, receiving each child and then providing the kind of inspiration and challenge, the opportunities and support for the advancement of the cause. Well, let's look at when the African Americans, our ancestors, came here in chains. Mm -hmm. They came with their African religions, their Yoruba religions, they all their various traditions, etc. They had the drum for communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden Christianity comes into this and in various ways they began to worship uh, a Christian God. How, how did this transition occur and how was this related to this struggle for freedom and justice? You know, the African religion has always been pragmatic. It always looked at spirituality and the social, economic, and political realities as part of the same reality. Therefore, Africans tend to ask, how does this practice tend towards our wholeness? How does it give us strength to cope with the threats to our survival? Mm -hmm. So that's already a part of the African mentality. And also remember that the African religion tended to have multiple expressions of divinity. There is divinity within the natural world, there's a divinity within the self, and then there's a divinity mm -hmm. above. So when the African slaves reach the shores here, out of a kind of African spirituality, they sought not so much a new religion, but a religion in which their spiritual values were reinforced. And in regards to Christianity, they found that within Christianity, there were certain elements like respect for community, like respect for the elderly, like confidence that though peril and a oppression may abound, that ultimately justice would prevail in the universe. They found that, hey, this religion is capable of providing for us mm -hmm. a vision and vitality for the sustenance of our community. So they, they, they are very adaptable people. But many of the Africans, not so much those who came from West Africa, were Muslim. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's always uh, crossed my mind is why is it that uh, Mohammedans, Muslim, Islam, didn't become the religion we embrace, or was it because the oppressor, the slaveholders' religion was Christian, and therefore we identified, maybe forced to identify with that particular religion, and then use some of the characteristics you described uh, mm -hmm. to keep up the struggle for freedom and justice. My assumption is that if America had been an Islamic uh, culture, mm -hmm. that you and I mm -hmm. more likely would have been naturally, and I'm yeah. talking even before the right. development of the current mm -hmm. growth of right. the Muslim community, mm -hmm. we probably would have been more predominantly uh, Muslim in our religious perspective. So there's an adaptive phenomenon, well, religious see, phenomenon that went on. That's right. The slave always had to deal with what mm -hmm. is it within the oppressive arrangement mm -hmm. holds promise for my ultimate liberation. Then how did, you, how did the black church help us to use that in the struggle? That's right. The black church helped us to use it by skillfully 
identifying with the Geiger counter of hope, where is there within this Christian religion something that promotes the well-being of our people? Mm -hmm. So they found out that, oh, there's joy in it. So they talk about make a joyful noise so they could embrace that. There was spirit. Spirit, hey, we already have an edge on that. We came from a spiritualizing culture. The call to liberty and justice for everybody, that God loves everybody. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. So this business of God's respect for each person was actually the way we were going to subvert Christianity as used by the slave master to be the Magna Carta of our own liberation. So what we did is we kind of sniffed around mm -hmm. and saw that in the Christ that we read about in between the lines, even after slave preachers, uh, even after the slave masters taught us a religion that was designed to keep us docile mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. contained, we sniffed out in that word a liberating truth. And therefore, mm -hmm. some of us think that our brand of Christianity may be more authentic mm -hmm. to the original biblical version than some of the latter day versions of Christianity that try to separate our liberty from our religion. Now the black church then became an organizing as well as a spiritual mechanism because the slave owners didn't mind the slaves, the Africans, coming together to pray and to hear the words of the Lord. Yet within that context there was this organizational mechanism that allowed the, the plotting and the planning and the, the, the hymns, steal away, uh, yes. seek out your liberties and so on. Yes, that's right. I mean, for people who would wish to give us a religion that's just for our hearts, we discovered that the religion God gave us overflowed into our hands, our head, and our feet. And therefore, if we got a little dose of religion on Sunday morning and it filled our hearts, if we wanted to make the next round of the escapes, that religion would sort of uh, filter down to our feet and we would make the great getaway. It is, it is this inability for the black church to have religion that is quarantined to just one precinct of our being. Now, what about the leadership? Now, the leadership of the older black church, did, did, was that a charismatic leadership? Was it a political leadership? Was it economic leadership? How, how were the original ministers selected? Well, obviously, when the, you, you measure the message by who was selecting mm -hmm. the uh, representatives. Mm -hmm. And I am sure that in the early days, slave masters sought out persons who could be used to, in a sense, keep the natives uh, quiet. quiet. Mm -hmm. But there is a competition that if these people had the religion of the Christ and had actually met the spirit of liberty in their personal experience, they could not be trusted simply to do the bidding of the slave masters who employed them mm -hmm. so that they would <coughs> say what was necessary to be said while the slave master was around, <coughs> take a glass of water, clear their throats and say, now children, let me tell you what the real right, scoop the real is on this. And of course, uh, through the Civil War, through Reconstruction, Mm -hmm. uh, through the early 19th century, the urban migration, and then finally the uh, Southern Christian leadership and Martin Luther King and the mm -hmm. Montgomery bus boycott, all of a sudden the church has a major role in that, the Civil Rights Revolution, which brings me to today. Mm -hmm. uh, you are the senior minister of Riverside Church, one of the largest and most prestigious uh, Protestant churches in New York City. Uh, a population of communicants which is now more African-American than Caucasian, a reversal of the way it used to be. What is, are you doing, what is Riverside doing to help advance the cause of freedom, justice, understanding, equality in New York City and the world? Well, Dr. Brown, you know, you will understand this. Any of us who have become the first African Americans to hold posts mm -hmm. that have been held by other people before. One of the things that we do without even getting a programmatic design is to be. Just to be black and present in the post is an extraordinary vocation. Mm -hmm. Then to be qualitatively present, that is, 
to demonstrate that although others have often felt that excellence came in one variety, mm -hmm. but that excellence indeed exists in other areas mm -hmm. as well, to be present with quality that, that's programmatic. You don't, you don't write a resume and put it on, guess what, I was present with quality. But you, if you are a quality leader, that's making a statement by itself. But also your presence in an integrated context mm -hmm. forces everybody to examine whether their stereotypes, whether their prejudices, mm -hmm. whether their sense of the possibility or impossibility of black contribution to life for us all. Mm -hmm. Your standing there and presiding, whether it's up, uh, over a college, as in your case, or whether it is a church, in my case, people, without you even opening your mouth, they're doing theology, mm -hmm. sociology, and mm -hmm. psychology. Mm -hmm. And then more than that, you finally, after being and after being present, you are a convener. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you are black, right. you convene a certain group of people, some of them black, some of them white, but they've got to be committed to a context in which the, the color of your skin would be no barrier to the exercise of the fullness of your gifts. Mm -hmm. Then, let's get around to the programmatics. The style of any institution that receives someone who has been nurtured in the black church and in the black culture, the style <laughs> is going to change somewhat. It cannot remain the same yeah. if the person in the role is authentic to the tradition. And I've always said, mm -hmm. anybody who goes to a church that is not asking for the richness that your culture has given to you, mm -hmm. that anybody who goes to such a church would find that church to be injurious to his or her spiritual development. Any context that's not asking for the richness of that which I bring from my culture will stunt me and the rest of us who are in such a context. And it's reflected at Riverside in your music in particular. Well, yes. <laughs> to say, well, actually, and I don't want to take credit <laughs> yes, for, for all of the changes, <laughs> but the church itself has said, similar to the president who said he wanted a cabinet that looked like America. Mm -hmm. So we have decided that we want a music program that reflects the richness mm -hmm. of those people who regularly worship and also mm -hmm. those whom we are seeking to draw. Mm -hmm. So the commitment has been made to music that is diverse. And I said to the congregation early on, I said, now listen, we're going to work this together. Here's the way it's going to be. 75% of what we do in this congregation should be satisfactory to most of us because we've all come from pretty much the same culture. But anybody who finds that you, that you anyone who finds that he or she likes 100% of what we are doing automatically, mm -hmm. you can rest assured that we are oppressing somebody. So 25% <clears throat> of what we do, you shouldn't necessarily like it. Mm -hmm. That 25% should be what somebody else finds to mm -hmm. be a special delight. Now, if we find 75% mm -hmm. we like in common and be prepared to show our sophistication, because mm -hmm. I don't like that, mm -hmm. but it shows my capacity to be pluralistically sensitive mm -hmm. and inclusive of the cultural mm -hmm. expression of somebody else. So that's what we've said. Mm -hmm. We have not achieved it yet, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Brown. We are still struggling. Mm -hmm. As you know, the sense of what is excellent has often been determined by European mm -hmm. norms. Mm -hmm. To redefine excellence so that the, the panel that, that discusses and finally defines excellence, that that panel is made up of multiple mm -hmm. expressions, that, that mm -hmm. comes slowly. And so mm -hmm. it isn't what it used to be. Uh, but but I it's not what it's going to be. It's <laughs> not what it's going to be <laughs> That's if we continue lines. to That's press on our way. That's exactly right. Now, now what about social issues? I know Riverside has been very up front in terms of the AIDS battle to yes. keep people sensitive about what AIDS is and looking at ways of preventing it and bringing our community together. Yes. Well, now, one of the major problems when we first began to uh, struggle with the problem of HIV AIDS was that the, the disease then was thought to be mm. a gay disease. Mm. And many of the traditional black churches were not prepared to respond on the basis of their strong negativity mm -hmm. with respect to various sexual mm -hmm. orientations and lifestyles. The Riverside Church had already in 1985 made up its mind that the Christianity it espoused accepted all people and that that meant we accept gay and straight, we accept black and white, Asians, Hispanics, mm -hmm. learned and unlearned. That means we were not, as it were, held back from showing care, 
sensitivity from the very beginning. So a very strong AIDS ministry and an AIDS emphasis developed. We were excited that we had several of our members to actually head some of the earlier AIDS programs. In fact, Ron Johnson, who is our AIDS uh, uh, czar here in the city, is a member mm -hmm. of our church. So we, d we were able, I think, to do two things. Number one, to tell people, you cannot sit around spending your time asking how somebody got a disease. Mm -hmm. Your job, if you're really a Christian, is to offer as much care and support as you possibly can. And I have tried to mm -hmm. preach this all over the United States mm -hmm. and all over the city as well, that, that AIDS tests our humanity mm -hmm. more than, than many of the other uh, indices that we have often looked mm -hmm. to. In addition to the AIDS ministry, our church has been exceedingly invested in its concern for the people who were homeless. homeless. So we've had for 10 years a homeless shelter mm -hmm. at the Riverside Church. We have ended that one. We have a task force now asking whether we should devise a program that moves in a different mm -hmm. direction. We have had food uh, pantry, as most of our churches are having, clothing pantry uh, to help people find uh, comfort in the midst of the cold weather. We've had a program for young people, not just the members of our church, but a program for our young people in the community. Mm -hmm. We've developed rites of passage mm -hmm. programs. We have AA, NA, church counseling, dramatics as a means of enriching the quality of people's lives. We have participated in Harlem uh, congregations for community improvement. We are a part of Harlem initiatives together. And we have had the great joy of being the place where when Nelson Mandela was set free from mm -hmm. prison, his first church experience in the United States after that was a service at Riverside. If I live to be a hundred, I do not believe I will ever experience a more exhilarating worship moment than when Ola Tunji began to call right. to worship and uh, Nelson Mandela and his wife came down the nave and spoke mm -hmm. there at uh, Riverside Church. We have continued to be supportive of the cause of liberty in around the world and, uh, and disarmament mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. you name it. We, if it's a social issue that has go to, to do with liberation, Riverside is on the case. The word is call Jim Forbes and go to Riverside. Well, yeah. well, we've got a large staff that is able to help so that where I can't be we present. Have a, we have a great leader too. Well, all right. Now the church and the mores of society are frequently tested by pivotal events. Uh, recently, a pivotal event occurred in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, a bombing of a federal mm -hmm. building. Turns out that the person who is now held responsible is a right-wing white person who is disenchanted with the society and apparently mobilized around uh, militias and other groups who are challenging the Constitution, challenging the president. What's the role of the church in helping America, particularly white America, to confront the extremists that are carrying these messages of poison throughout this country? I think the first uh, role of the church is to pay attention to the fundamental teachings of the founder of Christian tradition. And that is, Jesus said that the people who live by the sword will perish by the sword, which is to say that the church has got to continue to lift up the fact that violence of any form will frustrate the aspirations of those who use it as a primary means to achieve their objectives. So whether it is the bombing, which we deplore, a dastardly deed to be sure. However, I once had a man in my church who saw a woman whipping a child in the street. And the parent was really beating the kid so badly until this deacon, Deacon Lightfoot, said to me, you know what? You see that parent? That parent is trying to beat out of that child what the parent has put in that child. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which those of us who deplore violence may have sown the seeds in the decibel level of our rhetoric, mm -hmm. in the anger and bitterness, in the prejudice we have promoted, in the kind of classist attitudes, in the kind of assault against the government, the assault against our leaders, we inadvertently help to create the climate. And the problem is, most of us, when we talk mean-spirited stuff, 
when we have spew out venom about some folks, most of us have enough sense not to do anything drastic mm -hmm. about it. But there are always folks mm -hmm. of what I call <clears throat> fragile temperament mm -hmm. who will act out the implications mm -hmm. of the mean-spirited things we say. And, and the church has a responsibility to begin to encourage civil engagement mm -hmm. even around conflictual matters. But see, part of this mean-spiritedness is mean-spiritedness as you kick people off of welfare at a certain time, that you don't let them get health care at a certain time, as you don't provide child care, and then that whips up this anti-government rhetoric and, as you say, some of the extremists, the, the crazies, as it were, mm -hmm. will, will, will act on it. Can the church, should the church, take a position on these various social issues that are now becoming so divisive? Affirmative action, welfare, uh, health care, child care. Let me say to you that anyone who reads the New Testament must be aware of the fact that Jesus was not spending his time simply encouraging folks to be good. Jesus was interested in saving souls but also in transforming systems. When you ask about affirmative action, read the fifth chapter of Matthew where the Beatitudes talk about blessed are ye poor and so forth, blessed are you that mourn. This is a Magna Carta of affirmative action that Jesus said, those of you who are down and out, guess what? You are charter members of the realm of God called the kingdom of God that I have come to announce. Jesus furthermore makes it clear when in the 25th chapter of Matthew, Jesus says that if you did not visit your sick and did not help the homeless and did mm -hmm. not feed the hungry, uh, you will be banished to the place of punishment. But if you fed the hungry and clothed the naked and visited those in prison, you then will be mm -hmm invited into the joys of the Lord. And they said, "How? why is this? Because you did it for them, you were doing it for me. Now you can't read the Bible like that and let religion be on the basis of my little personal feel good inside. Anyone's religion that does not involve social, economic, and political implications on top of the spirit that one has in one's heart is using a distorted understanding of the Christian faith. So but what about when those understandings conflict? See, a lot of the right wing comes from certain aspects of the church who are making a more literal interpretation of both the Bible and the Constitution. Well, the point is that there are two kinds of religion, you say, the right mm -hmm. wing and the left wing. And I, I tell you, I want mm -hmm. to acknowledge that mm -hmm. sometimes those of us who are so-called progressive Christians, liberal Christians, mm -hmm. we are blessed with certain advantages and we kind of mm -hmm. get a little complacent mm -hmm. that we should challenge mm -hmm the distortions we hear in right-wing religion. Mm -hmm. And I think that liberals have gotten absolutely too mm -hmm. comfortable, too urbane, too, too uh, erudite in their style mm -hmm. to cry out. And I had a president at Virginia Union University who once said, a fool shouted in the marketplace, and because no one challenged him, mm -hmm. his thesis became incontrovertible. I remember that. Mm -hmm. If we don't stand up, mm -hmm. make use of every means of communication available to us to offer a liberating version of Christianity, then if we don't do that, we have ourselves to blame for the growth mm -hmm. of a mean-spirited and a pietistic individualism that does not address the problems of all God's children. Blame ourselves for that if we don't find effective means to promote the vision of liberty that we think we see in Christianity. Looking to the future, the world of the 21st century, what will be the role of the black church in helping not only African Americans but Latinos and other people of, col of color in the struggle for freedom and justice? My sense is that the black church's role will be like every other church's role. Each mm -hmm. person is required to join together with people to analyze the context in which you're living, mm -hmm. to draw from the faith the energy and perspective to address it in a liberating way. Mm -hmm. So there's a role for the black church, and that role will be historically the same. We've got to know the truth. We've got to be a center 
that that promotes not only black individuals but the well-being of the black community. This is happening with the Congress of National Black Churches, of which I am a part, where the major mm -hmm. black denominations, the Baptists, the Methodists, and the Pentecostal, mm -hmm. have come together. Yeah. And they have decided that religion that mm -hmm. does not advance to the programmatic stage is an aborted mm -hmm. form of religion. What about the financial stage, since the black church is the largest resource of funds in our community. We understand that we of the black church raise more money than some nations have in their whole mm. treasure mm. of a nation. We must be more effective in doing targeted use of the precious resources. Mm. We used to call that being good stewards. Mm. We got money and we let it out of the community mm. without that money lifting our mm. community then we do not even carry the same kind of wisdom that the so-called oppressor groups have. We've got to be wiser than that. We must make sure that the good money that people bring to us will not only keep the church doors open, but will keep the energy of life flowing through our community so that our race will be able to take its place around the table of the common good. Jim. I'm so pleased that you presented the, I should say Reverend Forbes, mm -hmm. these points uh, so poignantly because this is the struggle that we face and it's folks like you, the leaders of the black church that are going to make this possible. I want to thank you for coming and spending some time as a legend on African American legends. And thanks for the opportunity to be engaged with uh, a person who has been on the frontier for us a long time. And we will stay on the frontier. A long time. <laughs>